Alrighty, let's talk about surviving the apocalypse. What do you need to survive a serious shake-up, a collapse, maybe something even extreme as civil war, uh, or something that we as a country faced in World War II, which is basically being cut off from the rest of the world? Uh, what do you need to do to be able to make it? There's a number of important things. One of the biggest things is you need to have some kind of productivity. Now, I don't just mean your labour. As happened to my family firsthand, especially the people that lived in this very house, um, that walk the same floor that I walk every day when I get out of bed. Um, when you're in the city and you've got to pay for everything that comes in and everything that goes out, um, you know, pay for incoming electricity and all this sort of, you know, rent and shit like that, you're sort of caged in to a situation um, in regards to you've got a lot of ongoing costs and when there's no demand you know and the only thing you've got is your labor and your skills and when there's no demand for labor as there wasn't during the depression the people in the city suffers, suffered badly, uh, while people like us out here, you know, as the woman who grew up as a kid in this house said, she never saw any sign of poverty until she went to school and saw other kids in clothes that were just not much better than rags. Um, but her herself never had any problem with shoes, always had good shoes, good clothes, never in want of anything. All because her family was productive. You've got to produce something. And of course, in the line of um, needs versus wants, well, people are going to buy food. It's a funny thing that people, no matter how bad things are, people will always continue to buy food. They mightn't want to buy flat screen TVs, but they always want to buy food. And as an extension to that, one that I've also come to notice is warmth. That's right. Some way of heating their building. That may be very, very much so the case in the United States and Canada. Not as much here but it still is the case here. Um, but, you know, they can sort of almost get away with that if they can't afford it, uh, although that is one of the things that tends to be on the priority list shortly after food in many circumstances. So you've got to be productive. There's another thing I advocate, which is being able to I've never given a talk on this, and I probably should make a friggin' career out of it, turning entire factories into off-grid production by substituting equipment. You know, I know of different kinds of spray guns that some will take a shitload of power, and there's one that I've got here that takes almost nothing energy-wise to get the same amount of paint onto whatever you're painting. Um, and, I mean, it's shockingly low. You know, and where there's cheap labour in Asia, you know, they can do some things a bit more by hand or, like, really speaking, not even that. You can just change the method. But anyway, I'm getting off track. What I'm trying to say is it's a great thing to be able to have your productivity off-grid, not only in the sense of needing to buy in fuel, to produce stuff, but also being able to produce stuff without 
necessarily being reliant on somebody else bringing stuff in. Now, if you're building stuff out of steel, this may be a bit of an issue because it's not that easy to smelt steel in your backyard, although I have seen people cast aluminium um, with a big, you know, you got enough green sand and you got enough flame and gas for your blowtorch, hey, you know, you got a long way that you can go casting aluminium. Um, but I'm thinking more so of piggeries and chicken farms around here that rely entirely on outside feed. And there's one battery hen place that grows its own feed. And they have been able to outpace any contracts with supermarkets over everybody else purely because they grow their own food. And the only real thing they're worried about, once again, is fuel to run tractors. And the rest of the stuff Hey, they bring it in as grain. Instead of feeding it as palletized stuff, they've got hammer mills they put it through, they add this in, they add that in. They know exactly what they've got to do to get all the protein levels up to scratch and everything, and they make their own feed, and it saves them a shitload. They're lucky in the fact that they do have a lot of flat, good quality country for growing grain as well um, that they obviously bought out because um, <laughs> they've been uh, around for a while and they had a bit too many profits and they needed to uh, sink them into something for tax purposes and it was more land to grow their um, grain crops for their chickens. So if something was to happen, a grain supplier, like a feed supplier, the piggeries and most of the chicken farms around here would cop it up the arse and it doesn't mean a damn thing to them because they're all pretty much self-sufficient in that way, aside from diesel, um, which, you know, hash a deal out with some of the canola growers or grow some canola themselves and they could just about get out of that as well. Um, but then they'd still be relying on electricity for all their fan ventilation systems. What I'm trying to say is the more stuff that you can provide for yourself to be productive, the better off you're going to be. Now, the next big thing is to have a network of people um, and by that I mean other people who are good with other shit that you may need and you know that does include fixing things up, welding things, fixing cars, maybe somebody who you know is good with gasification systems or something like that, you know whatever your general needs are going to be, you know food, heat and warmth and it wouldn't be too bad an idea to have working vehicles which means you might need to it'd be a good idea to know a wrecker and to you know know um, you know someone who's good with gasifiers or you know an engineer or and you also want somebody who's got a bit of a clue with medical stuff and I don't necessarily mean they can you know get you in Valium or whatever um, you know drugs you're after, but even people who are good enough with herbal medicine, and let me tell you, the Chinese have some bloody brilliant herbal medicine, so, you know, that may be an avenue into it. There was a Vietnamese girl I talked to online on a dating site, and her parents, although they're Vietnamese, they were experts in Chinese medicine, and in Vietnam, before they left, they used to have a shop that just sold Chinese medicine. And they knew bloody everything there was to know um, about Chinese medicine. So you need to have a network of people, you know. And we're talking guys who can fix thing, guy, fix things, guys who, you know, medical backgrounds, um, you know, alternative fuel backgrounds, food growing, and all this stuff. But you've got to be able to have something that you can offer these guys. And once again. I'm not just talking labour, um, because the labour market will be absolutely fucking saturated in the case of a depression or something like that. Um, and, you know, one thing which you don't need a qualification for but is a skill in and of itself is being able to improvise. Now, let me tell you, because farmers in this country are not subsidised worth a shit, uh, even the drought relief is a joke. All it is is we pay your power bill, so you've got a bit of a, 
a better chance to not default on your mortgage, but we still know you're going to run behind on your mortgage anyway. Um, so we'll just pay your power bill to help you. That's pretty much the only form of uh, any real government assistance they get. Um, one point there, although they're trying to cut back on it, they would give you a, back a bit of your fuel tax from the diesel you used to buy for your tractors. That's about it. Um, but as a result, you know, we're competing on the world market with people who are subsidised. And it means that we really know, you know, we've got to know how to make the friggin' <laughs> shit turn a profit regardless of all the friggin' odds. Um, and as a result, Australian farmers have become brilliant at improvisation, brilliant at fixing things. And me, uh, like my father and my dad's boss, you know, where I grew up as a kid, you couldn't just go down the shop and get shit. You couldn't just go get coffee. It was too far away. Steel, forget about it. You know, that was a real long way away. Um, so they had, they kept all their old rotten equipment and anything and um, give them an angle grinder and a bunch of welding rods and a PowerPoint and they could build just about frickin' anything. And I mean... You wouldn't believe some of the shit they could have built, you know, some of the things they built, hoppers for manning on the back of trucks to feed out to blooming sheep and, you know, all with the blooming, you know, cable coming right next to the blooming open window so you can pull the cable and control what the hopper's doing and all that. The whole lot built by hand, you know, with nothing but an angle grinder a friggin' steel ruler or tape measure and a bunch of welding rods and a welder, you know? Fascinating. But that is one thing that there is no real qualification for improvisation. If you've seen the shit I've seen done with fencing wire, like there's nothing you can't do with fencing wire. It's the duct tape of country Australia. And, um, you know, this is, this is another good skill to have that you might not necessarily need a qualification for. But, um, yeah, create a group of people, a network of people. And, you know, the more of these friends you have, the better. Best to cut out the mooches and the people who whinge and whine and don't really have anything to offer. You know, all they'll do is hold you all back, fuck them off, leave them in the dust. Um, you know, and there may be times where you have family members like that. I was there once at a Christmas party a few Christmases ago with my family members. I fucking shit you not. Aside from one cousin who was in school and the other one who was in university, I was the only one who had a job that wasn't a government job. Now that's scary. If you start thinking about places where the government has literally gone bankrupt, like Albania, you know, and Russia, you know, hell, during 98 they defaulted, and, um, you know, that, that sort of, that sort of echoed on from one country to the next to the next, and, and, you know, Thailand initially went down when they floated the currency and it didn't work out for them, and, and, you know, it hit Russia, it hit friggin' Indonesia, north of us. We used to turn the news on every day, there'd be fucking riots every fucking day. And, you know, around that time, me and Michael were talking to an Indonesian girl in his church, and he said, like, she said, it's basically like a state of civil war. It's like fucking endless riots. It's just, it just doesn't end over there. When you realise that the cost of living went up three and a half fold, you might understand where they were coming from. Um, but, you know, this is the thing. If you've got enough people that you can sort of, as a group, etch out the self-sufficiency, um, yeah, that would be a very good thing, and you would likely make it, but you've, you know, you've got to be honest, and um, even family members who want to mooch off you, you've got to be careful of all that. I mean, I know they're family, but... Um, you know, don't let them burn the toast with one of your good friends that you need as part of your 
uh, network of uh, people to create self-sufficiency as a group or something like that. Um, and uh, anyway, I'll talk about uh, plants in a second video and what you can grow to keep your ass afloat in uh, the manner of plants.